Uh, before I invite uh, Mr. Rajiv Sardesai, we have two uh, ceremonial acts to do. I will now call upon Mr. Rajiv Sardesai to formally release the academic programs brochure of the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. He will also unveil the new official scarf of the Jindal Global University with the sixth color depicting the color of the Jindal School of Journalism as well. Now I call upon Mr. Radeep Sardesai to deliver his distinguished public lecture on the theme, the ethics and professional obligation of journalists in a democracy. Mr. Radeep Sardesai, as I mentioned earlier, is the consulting editor of India Today Group and has been one of the most distinguished journalists, maintaining his highest integrity and rectitude all through his journalistic career. We are very delighted that he is at this launch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajkumar, for those kind words. Uh, Dr. Rajkumar, distinguished uh, guests here, faculty, friends, and students who have assembled here. Let me first say I deem it a great honor to be invited to give the inaugural lecture at the Jindal, as the Jindal Global University embarks on yet another exciting adventure, this time by setting up a school of journalism and communication. You are setting up this project at a time when journalism and the media in this country, and indeed across the world, are facing a real credibility crisis. I was sent a video a few days ago which had Hollywood celebrity actor Denzel Washington making a telling comment on the state of the US media. Asked what he thought of a particular newspaper report that had named him as a potential US president candidate one day, he said, and I quote, if you don't read a newspaper, you may be uninformed. If you read it, you are very likely to be misinformed. What is true of the United States, and this video has now gone viral, is even more relevant in the Indian context. I was interested to see the two distinguished professors speak of Donald Trump uh, more than once. Trust me, sirs, we have politicians in this country who will out-Trump Trump any day, any time of the year. I was. Peter Shook spoke about how Hillary Clinton hasn't done a serious press conference in six months. And you also spoke about how, uh, interview, uh, the, uh, how Donald Trump hasn't given a serious interview in a long time. <coughs> Sirs, we have a leader of the opposition who hasn't done an interview in the last three years, and we have a prime minister who hasn't given a single press conference in the last two and a half years. I also saw that Donald Trump is now almost deciding foreign policy on Twitter. <laughs> Trust me, sir, we have leaders in this country also who are deciding on major financial and foreign policy issues on Twitter. I mean, I won't be surprised tomorrow if notifications of the Reserve Bank of India are now done on Twitter and then clarified the next day by the finance minister. Actually, the governor didn't mean this. <laughs> We've had 51 notifications and counting. Somehow this is not comforting. <laughs> Somehow this is not comforting. Yes, it is. 
As I said, what is true of the United States is even more relevant in the Indian context. More people follow news across various platforms, but it is equally possible that fewer people trust the news that is being disseminated. We have today in this country more than 400 licensed news channels in this country. In fact, when I looked at the INB website, the number was 408. And now with my friend, Mr. Goswami, adding another channel, it will be 409. We are in the republic of news channels. <laughs> Thousands of newspapers and magazines, many news websites. And yet the information overflow has tragically actually led in this country to a lowering of standards rather than a raising of the bar. At the core of this seeming paradox lies the business model and the ethical challenges confronting modern day journalists. Is news about TRPs or television rating points on television, which is the dominant medium in this country at least of our times, or is it about another form of TRP, what I call trust and respect points? Would I be right in saying that journalists today are feared more than their predecessors were, but respected less? Has sensation replaced sense? Has chaos replaced credibility? Has news been replaced by noise? Are we no longer the dispassionate observers of events, the chroniclers of what is happening in the world around us? Or have we become active players in the public arena? where we believe that we know more than what you know or what anyone else does. Are we driven today purely by commerce or do we really have a conscience? Are we an extension of the marketing and advertising machine, this industry which has been created, or is there a soul to journalism that can never be chained by the market? Just who is a journalist? Or rather, who should be a journalist in this contemporary media landscape. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to start with a personal journey. I'm often asked the question, why did you become a journalist? My answer quite simply is, I wasn't good at anything else. <laughs> this is only partly true. Yes, I grew up as the son of a former test cricketer and dreamt of playing for India one day. However, unlike politics or cinema, Cricket is driven by pure talent. A Rahul Gandhi can inherit the mantle of his family by virtue of his surname. An Abhishek Bachchan can become a film star by virtue again of his surname and the fact that he is Amitabh Bachchan's son. Cricket doesn't run in the blood. It requires a huge skill factor which is a combination of the divine and of hard work. I was around 19 when I realized that I simply wasn't good enough as a cricketer. I then turned to law and did a law degree from Oxford and even spent a few months in the Bombay High Court. I actually enjoyed the cut and thrust of legal debate. But at that time, I was a customs and excise intern at a legal company called Crawford Bailey. And I realized somewhere that I was simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. And so it was that as a failed lawyer and a failed cricketer, I turned to journalism. I had the good fortune of spending a summer vacation in college, interning at an afternoon paper in Mumbai in the 1980s called the Afternoon Dispatch and Courier, started by the venerable Behram contractor, better known as Busy Bee. In those few months, I fell in love with the sights and smell of a newspaper, got my first byline, loved the idea of simply just staying on top of the news. Which is why when I got a chance to be a trainee assistant editor at the Times of India in 1988, I jumped at the offer. As I said, I became a journalist because I am a failed cricketer and a lapsed lawyer. But I also became a journalist because I had an early passion for news and current affairs. I know you spoke about a US election. I remember the first US election that I was excited about, strangely enough, was Gerald Ford versus Jimmy Carter in 1976. And I remember going to the USIS library and when Carter won, running out and saying, look at it, a peanut farmer has actually become the president of the United States, just like a tea vendor's son is now the prime minister of this country. Which brings me to my unswerving belief that journalism in the end of the day is about passion for news above all else. It isn't about becoming famous or measuring success 
by how many eyeballs you get. When I became formally a journalist in 1988, there was no 24 by 7 news television in this country. The concept of breaking news didn't even exist. When you wrote a routine story, the byline was always by a staff reporter. Our anonymity, in a sense, was our safeguard against the pressures and the intoxicants of the outside world. We were never meant to be stars. We were just primarily meant to be diligent observers of the world around us. We were meant to be the cockroaches in the system, not the butterflies. We were the gorillas in the room, not the celebrities. Our primary role was to question diligently and seek answers. Answers that might expose corruption, not mask it. Answers that might help to put spotlight on the stories, not become the story ourselves. Importantly, we became journalists, or so I thought, to make a difference, howsoever small, not create differences among people. The quintessential journalist is an outsider in the system, not part of the establishment, a dissenter, not a follower. Our role is to keep away from the tentacles of those in power rather than become part of the power axis. It is, of course, easy to be enticed by the proximity to power. As journalists, we meet many powerful people and celebrities. Many of them are men and women of great charm and charisma. It is easy to get carried away by their allurements. The challenge is to resist them and do what we are expected to do. Be a watchdog, not a lapdog of the powerful. I remember reporting the Mumbai riots in 92-93 and being thrown out of a press conference by then Defense Minister Sharad Pawar because I persisted in raising the question of the delay in bringing in the armed forces to calm a city that had been torn apart by violence. I also remember being targeted by Hindutva forces for my reporting of the 2002 Gujarat riots because I once again questioned the role of powerful politicians and their lackeys. The Shiv Sena chief Bal Thakre once called me in a public gathering a scorpion, because I reported on the shameful act of the digging of a cricket pitch by his Shiv Sainiks of the Wankhede Stadium. When we broke the story of Otavio Quatroki's Beaufort's account being defrozen in 2007, I was warned that all access to the UPA1 leadership of Sonia Gandhi would end. And when Amar Singh of the Samajwadi Party was sent to jail in the cash for vote scam, he publicly warned me in this very hall that he would never forget or forgive what I had done. Yes, there, have been, there has been criticism along the way, but I have treated criticism, as I believe any journalist should, as a badge of honor. I still remember when Sharad Pawar threw me out of that press conference, I was delighted, because I thought I must have done something right. I believe journalists must treat criticism as an occupational hazard, and particularly the criticism of politicians as a badge of honor. Maybe at times I have erred like any other to my reader or my viewer, and that's always been the case. What is the nature of that commitment? To my mind, it is to be true to the story, to focus on facts, to be fair and balanced, not become a cheerleader of any side, but to be skeptical of all. There can be no place for what I now call in this country, Supari journalism. Supari, sirs, is, a, is being a hitman is like having a contract killing, where individual agendas seek to settle scores, censor stories, or fix people. It is deeply distressing for me as a journalist, for example, when a prominent news network uses its clout to show one-sided news only to further the agenda of their owners. I recall how in the run-up to the 2015 assembly election in Delhi, for example, a leading news, paper, a news network decided to ban the coverage of the Aam Aadmi Party only because it suited the owner's interests. That the Aam Aadmi Party still won a majority election, exposes or won this big majority in the elections, I think only exposes the limitations of big corporate media and their vested interests. Ownership indeed is a key issue in today's journalistic environment. Far too many political parties and corporates who are dependent on government decision making have made inroads into the media landscape. In each instance, 
This rising influence is affecting the growth of a truly independent media that is desirable in a democratic society. Corporate and political interests must be kept out of the newsroom if we are to sustain our commitment to a professional media environment. Which brings me to the next troubling challenge for modern journalists. How do we retain, in a sense, the sanity of the news, the essential goodness of the news, or the essential value of the news, in a media landscape which is populated by a new animal, namely social media, which effectively gives the power to every citizen, the power to express themselves in just 140 characters. Today on social media, you can shout, you can abuse, you can lie, you can defame with no gatekeeper. We are living in a media universe where journalists' choices as a result are not often determined by the editor sitting in a newsroom, but often done through a crowdsourced medium like Facebook or Twitter. It is almost as if when we have to decide what should be the news headline of the day, it's not decided on the basis of the value of the news, but will it trend on Twitter? <laughs> will I get a hashtag out of this news? Opinion is no longer being shaped by what is credible and what is right. It is being shaped by what is most provocative so that it can mirror what is happening in the social media. It is almost as if we in journal journalism have outsourced our functions to some anonymous functionary out there who could essentially be manipulating the media mind space today. We are, and I will come back to that in a moment, entering what in America they now call the post-truth society. You say a lie often enough, people will start believing it. Donald Trump is a good example of it. But trust me, sirs, again, there are many here who will out-Trump Trump. <laughs> we are also, in my view, let me also say, I grew up in a news culture where journalists were meant to strictly keep facts and opinions separate. In a newspaper, opinion was meant for the edit page. Television for signature debate shows. All that has changed. Under pressure from the marketplace, particularly the rise of social media, the lines between facts and opinion have been totally blurred. It is no longer enough to tell a story on primetime news. We are all meant to ask leading questions on the big story. The question already contains the answer because we have already decided who is right and wrong. We are no longer observers. We are judge, jury, and sometimes even executioners. There are times when a journalist must take a stand on a story. In the Jessica Lal case, for example, it was important to run a sustained campaign because there was a blatant miscarriage of justice that needed to be redressed. But there are other times when a similar approach leads to a trial by media where the basic principles of journalism and jurisprudence are being reversed. On many news shows now, you are guilty till proven innocent. This can lead to gross errors. I recall not too long ago, a young man in this city being accused of sexual harassment and of stalking a woman. All through the day, news channels ran a story dubbing the man as a pervert. It turned out that the story had been totally distorted. You might also remember the story of the Rotak sisters, two girls in Rotak, not far away from Sonepat, who said, that they had been sexually harassed and not been allowed to sit in the bus. They were even given awards by the Haryana government. It turned out that the entire story had been concocted and falsified. In the case of this young man who was dubbed a pervert, it was sadly too late because the young man lost his job. Who is going to be held accountable? I am not against talk, talk TV at all, but I think we must all realize that in today's world, talk comes cheap. Facts do not. Indeed, as the di difference and the distinction between facts and opinion evaporates, there is a quest question mark over this vexed notion of journalistic neutrality. 
personally, and this may not sound politically correct, I do not believe anymore in this notion of a neutral journalist. Or let me say it is a little overstretched. Facts are sacred. Opinions sometimes are not. Yes, we must be true to facts, but we must have the courage to express an opinion where required. We cannot become an outrage factory like Twitter, but yes, we must be ready to put out inconvenient truths in the public interest. Journalistic neutrality does not mean a sanitized version of a story or succumbing to individual or group pressures or becoming a prisoner of political correctness. If there is a riot, you must have the courage to call out the rioters. You cannot be neutral in a situation of organized violence, for example, in this country. When I grew up, we were told, my editor would tell me, Yar jo bhi karo, sorry, uh, whatever you do, don't mention the word Hindu or Muslim when there is a riot in Mumbai. And I remember along with three other journalists fighting for this in 92, 93. I said, sir, you are going to say Muhammad or so and so fighting with Ram, but you must be, and you don't want to mention that because you believe it will provoke violence, but people must know who are the villains. To my mind, it is important to do that. We must call out the villains of our society, wherever they exist. Let me also say that, you know, we cannot, and this is where the post-truth society enters, we cannot allow a lie to be simply perpetuated because it is part of a larger propaganda machine. Journalists cannot be propagandists, nor can we be public relations experts. There are lots of propagandists now around us. Lot of spin doctors have emerged who believe in one-way communication. Journalists cannot do that. We are supposed to be the fact checkers. We are supposed to call out the fact from the propaganda. Take the current demonetization debate. Like many a story, there are two sides to the demonetization story and the impact of it. There are stories of small grocers who are going cashless and working in a new ecosystem. But there are also stories of job cuts and hardships in small and medium enterprises. We must report both stories but also have the freedom to report and opine on them without being judged based on individual viewer or reader biases. It cannot be that reporting on the positive aspects of demonetization leads to a journalist to be seen as neutral by the government's own cheerleaders, and reporting on the negative side leads me to be dubbed as anti-national, biased, and worse. Society can perhaps afford to take a binary debate. Politicians certainly can. A journalist must move away from polarities. We became, as I said, journalists to be fact checkers, not cheerleaders and not propagandists. Which brings me to another disturbing element of the contemporary discourse on the role of the media and the professional challenges we face. We live in a time of high octane nationalism, where the narrative is now being spun about whether you are wearing your patriotism on your sleeve or not. You have to stand, remember, ladies and gentlemen, for the national anthem before cinema theatres. <laughs> With social media as an echo chamber for hate and outrage, journalists are being now branded depending on their ideological preferences. If you don't follow a particular discourse, and we saw this even in the American elections, you are anti-national, a news trader, or worst of all, a prostitute, an awful sounding word coined even more unfortunately in this country by a senior union minister who was once an army chief in this country. At the risk today of being branded a prostitute, let me say that I refuse to allow my patriotism to influence my commitment to report the truth. So in Kashmir, we must continue to report on the pernicious role played by terrorists, but also be a mirror to the human rights abuses that are committed by security forces. We must report on Hindu and Muslim communalism and see both as a menace to civil society. And when there are cross-border clashes, we must report the story and give space to both an Indian and a Pakistani perspective. My ethical belief system tells me that we must, as journalists, not put India first, but truth first. We cannot be, we cannot be flag-waving patriots. My nationalism as a journalist is not premised on the notion of my country right or wrong, but calling out my country when it is wrong 
and standing by it when it is right. Let us not confuse nationalism anymore in journalism with support to a government or an individual. No one in India has a monopoly on what constitutes nationalism. And I don't say this, uh, you know, one, many years ago I met a great BBC Director General, John Burt. And John Burt once told Margaret Thatcher at the height of the Falklands War, Madam, and this was in the context of a ship which had been sunk by the British Navy. And Margaret Thatcher was very upset that the BBC had carried the press conference of the Argentinians. He said, Madam, you represent the government. I represent truth. And that's a distinction that we in this country have forgotten. When a soldier dies on the border, an Indian soldier dies on the border, it's terrible. Do I not report the fact that maybe a Pakistani soldier has also been killed in the cross-border terror? It happened in 2013, ladies and gentlemen, and this is slightly off this, but I think it's important to say this. In 2013, two Indian, Indian Jawans were beheaded. It was terrible. Sushma Swaraj, then of course in the opposition where it's easier to talk, said we must have 10 <coughs> Pakistani heads for one Indian head. Fine, politicians are entitled to rhetoric. The truth is that four Pakistani soldiers had also been killed in the same clash. But if you were watching Indian news channels, you would only know about the two Indian soldiers beheaded and not the Pakistanis. To the point where many news channels were saying, we must go to war with Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, war mongering is not the job of a journalist. War mongering is the job maybe of an army chief or maybe of politicians. But I don't believe that journalists are doing their duty by calling for war against the so-called enemy. Above all else, I believe that journalism must reflect the liberal outlook on which our constitution, this great constitution that I believe the greatest Indian since Mahatma Gandhi gave this country, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar. The notion of individual rights, of basic freedoms, of tolerance, of compassion and equality. These are the templates that a journalist must turn to when making news choices, when deciding on news hierarchies. Which is why the story of a poor farmer who commits suicide in Marathwada may not trend on Twitter, but it must matter more than life and times of the metro elite of this country. An ethical journalist will not measure his success or failure by TRPs, but by the intrinsic value of a story. There may be no TRP boxes in Jharkhand or Chhattisgarh or the northeast of the country, but the stories from these far-flung areas should matter as much as a story from Delhi or a Mumbai. Sadly, this is not happening and reflects on just how far we have moved away from the moral compass of journalism. We report on flooding in Gurgaon, but we completely miss out on the floods in Assam. Even as we speak today, ladies and gentlemen, large parts of Manipur are under curfew. And the price of petrol is again rising there above 1,000 rupees. Will you see it on any of the news channels tonight on prime time? I doubt it unless you watch my program today because I made the effort of sending a journalist to Imphal only to send out a message that maybe others will learn from this somewhere and we will report the story of Manipur. We will play up a stray, absurd remark of a politician and spend hours discussing it, but will rarely if ever give the concerns to the voice of citizens who are often in this country still denied basic access to their rights, be it clean water, clean air, swift justice or better delivery systems in general. We will sensationalize stories on crime and conflict, on cinema or trivia, where the Shah Rukh Khan's ankle has been hurt will trend on Twitter and will become a headline. But we won't spend enough time focusing on health, education, science and environment. And while we will endlessly debate on what's gone wrong in the world around us, we must also ask ourselves, as journalists, do we ever want to report on what's positive in the society around us. Ladies and gentlemen, there should be little doubt that we need to urgently course correct if we are to stand the test of time, if we are to get back our lost respect as journalists. Page three cannot be page one. Shah Rukh's ankle injury is an interesting story, but it should be where it is. It cannot be a front page story or a top news headline. TRPs cannot decide news hierarchies. As I said, there may be no TRP in Manipur, 
but Manipur is a part of this great country of India. And I remember a Manipur journalist last year when I was there telling me at a press club event, he said, sir, what will it take for Manipur, which, is under, which was again under curfew at the time, for it to become the first headline story? And I said something which later on turned out, which I almost regretted. I said, you'll have to do something dramatic. A week later, this group of protesters who had met me, who had been on this curve, who had been agitating, actually went and burnt an MLA and minister's house. And one of them then rang me up and sent me a WhatsApp message. Sir, we burnt the minister's house. Will you now report our plight? <laughs> and I wonder what kind of society and what kind of nation we want to build. We talk of nationalism. Does our nationalism preclude us from telling the story of Manipur? Or does our nationalism only be, is only served by berating Pakistani generals who have long retired 10 and 20 years ago and hold them responsible for anything and everything that goes on in Pakistan? This is not nationalism. This is TRP nationalism. Finally, let me end this lecture as I begin, as I began on a personal note. Some of my happiest days as a young journalist were spent reporting in both print and television from the field. I have had the great fortune of traveling the length and breadth of this incredible country, meeting all kinds of wonderful people, listening to stories of tragedy and triumph. India is a great country to do journalism in because of its sheer diversity. I often tell this to my friends from England. You ought to live in a very boring country. The BBC reports the same thing every day. Even Americas are not, nothing compared to what we are. We are the greatest country when it comes to journalism. Today, in Tripura, an MLA has snatched the mace from the speaker and run away. Which other country will an MLA one day slide, slide, you know, take away? It's, it's going viral on, on, on Facebook. It's an incredible story in this incredible country. There are lots of people in the nooks and crannies of this vast country where the real stories of India are. There are stories of hope, stories of distress, but it is in the voices and lives of millions of Indians that journalism lies. Stories are not located in the rarefied pages of an edit page or in the AC comfort of a television studio. I know I say this having spent many years in a television studio, but trust me, it's not where I get my joy. My joy even on demonetization and when I go to the ground and listen to people is very different. It's very easy for a politician to come in the studio on demonetization and say, it's inconvenience. You should tell the inconvenience to a person who has lost his daily wage. That is inconvenience. And that person is the story to be told of, uh, of demonetization, not the story of a politician who's following a propaganda. These are the stories, there are many stories that have not been told in this great country which must provide an opportunity and a challenge for the next generation. Let me say at the very end that the journalists and the students who are here in this room who will go to journalism school are what I would like to call the lucky generation. When I was growing up, we didn't have journalism schools in this country. The newsroom was my best teacher. We grew up in the age when there were just a handful of newspapers and just good old Doordarshan. Today we live in a multimedia age with content no longer confined to any single platform. Now there is such a range of options that young journalists can pick and choose, create unique content across mediums. Yes, there is a lot of hype and noise around us. News has been what I call McDonaldized and become a bit of like fast food where today's news is the next day's history. But in the end, I do believe that quality content will matter. We need strong, effective gatekeepers who will separate the news from the noise, reporters who will tell stories without fear or favor, editors who will withstand external pressures and will mentor the young, which is why we need a strong, professional, journalistic education, today more than ever before. As I said, in the end, quality content will always win. Importantly, ethics will matter more than anything else. I don't know if there will be a course in the Jindal University on ethics, but I will urge you to have one. Yes, we have a commitment to the reader, viewer, or netizen, but the ultimate commitment that a journalist must have, as indeed all Indians must have, is to our conscience, to a steadfast, steadfast commitment to the truth and to the idea of a better India 
and a better world. Thank you very much.